Hi, and welcome to yet another video on my YouTube channel. Today we will look at uh, one game, classical game by the legendary player Akiba Rubinstein. And by looking at this game, I will try to uh, convey you the importance of uh, prophylaxis in chess. Wise men have said that uh, chess is a game of prophylaxis. In fact, um, even if you look at the games of uh, such great attacking players like Kasparov, you will see that uh, he was also a very prophylactic player and very often his moves uh, included uh, prevention of his opponent's plans and ideas. And uh, the importance of prophylactics, I, I don't think it can be overstated. In fact, if you want an immediate improvement in your game, study prophylaxis. Study prophylaxis, employ prophylaxis in your games, and you will see a marked improvement in the quality of the moves that you will be making. Easier said than done, I agree, because um, prophylaxis de demands, requires some sort of um, um, deeper, I would say, chess understanding, uh, and uh, but also discipline, because you need to be disciplined in your thinking uh, during your game in order to be attuned at all times uh, to the uh, ideas, thoughts, and even emotions that your opponent may be feeling. So, um, uh, because we know how easy it is to get carried away uh, during a game with our own ideas, thoughts, calculations, combinations, all fascinating stuff. But in fact, in chess, you could even say chess teaches us humility, in fact, because in chess, the opponent is more important than yourself. And your opponent's ideas and then threats are more important than yours. So if you train yourself, if you discipline yourself to think like this during a game, you will, uh, I guarantee you, uh, achieve a marked improvement uh, in your results and also, like I said, quality of your moves. So uh, to illustrate, uh, I used this game from the Rubinstein Takac, which I also mentioned in my newsletter on Substack. I think you can subscribe there, uh, where you will get uh, a weekly newsletters every Saturday with uh, chess-related topics, inspiring, thought-provoking, original at times, well, things to think about. I think you will like that and enjoy it. So I mentioned this game in my newsletter, uh, like I mentioned, like I said. And uh, here I think I wanted to give you a more, let's say, detailed uh, explanation of what happened in, uh, in the game. So this is the position we have uh, here. We see that we have a Carlsbad structure, yeah, which is character characterized by these two pawns, four white on the queen side and this very long connected pawn structure in the center and on the king side, whereas black has four pawns here on the queen side and the center and three pawns on the king side. So very col colorful green pawns here. Well, in the um, Carlsbad structure, one of the baiting plans for uh, white is the minority attack. We see that white has already started that with b4. The idea is to go a4, b5, take on c6 and create a weak pawn on c6. But black has defended by playing a6. Um, preventing b5 for the time being. White, in the meantime, brought a knight to a5 to uh, attack that pawn on b7, so the rook on a7 is pretty passive. So in this position, black played the move king f7. And it's easy to pass by this move, and I think this is the, the reason why, let's say, uh, games of strong players are easily... Um, um, not misunderstood, but um, uh, difficult to understand, let's say, because you would see a move like king f7 and you just easily conclude, okay, this is just centralization of, of the king, it's a natural move, uh, okay, that's it. Yeah. But usually more things happen in the position when strong players play a game of chess. And here, in fact, if you delve more deeply into the position, you realize that, in fact, black created a threat by playing king f7. Not easy to grasp 
at, at first sight. Yeah, but in fact, the threat is the move f4. So why is f4? Uh, why why did Black need King f7? Because if he played f4 immediately, why well, can just take that pawn? And we see that the Black's problem here is that the rook on e8 is not defended, and the knight on e6 cannot recapture. Let's say on d4. So once you understand this, then you understand that King f7 defends the rook. And we have the threat of f4 now looming. And this is the moment where Rubinstein applies prophylactic thinking. And, uh, thinking. Um, in fact, the, the, the question here is how you deal with the threat of f4. And he comes up with a, with a really great move, one of those, as Nimtsovich called them, mysterious rook moves. And um, uh, again, it's a difficult move and, and, and it's easy to when you go over a game quickly, it's easy to miss and easy to uh, uh, fail to understand. Because the move that he played is the move rook c2. And then if you go over the game quickly, it's like, well, well, rook c2, what is this rook c2? Yeah. So you need actually to pause and try to understand why this move was played. As I mentioned, it's a deeply prophylactic move. It deals with the threat of f4. So how does it deal with the threat of f4? Well, we check what happens in case of f4. So in case of f4, White's intended move was, is rook ce2. And now we see the idea of rook c2. The idea is to double on the e-file and prepare for the opening of the e-file. Now again, there is a threat of e takes f4 because the two rooks Again, pin the knight on e6, and the king is no longer sufficient defense for that rook on e8. And in case of f takes e3, rook takes e3, again taking advantage of this pin. So now the pawn is not hanging because the rook on e8 is falling. Yeah. And white, see how nicely the rook got transferred from c1 to e3 with this maneuver rook c2, rook e2, rook e3. In case black continues attacking the pawn on d4 with bishop f6, White can play bishop e5 and still have a dominating position. You see how, in fact, black is suffering because of this pressure on the e-file. So you see how deep this move is. Yeah? So it's not a, it's not a, let's say, a, a, a primitive prevention of the of the white of black's idea of f4. For example, by playing f4. Uh, himself, yeah, which it would be a bad move, but it's not prophylaxis can uh, is is often deep, but then it's as it at its best or its most beautiful, you could say. So you, you get to appreciate a move like rook c2 only when you understand the idea behind it, and this this is the beauty of prophylactic moves: it's depth and the idea behind it. Uh, once understood, and then you realize, and you go, wow. And and to my mind, such moves are no less beautiful than some beautiful deep combinations of sacrificial attacks. And you know, when you see this move rook c2 and you understand it, you say, wow. Yeah? So this is high level chess. So with f4 uh, prevented, black plays bishop b6. Yeah? The idea is to put more pressure on d4 and maybe go f4 again. Yeah? And now Rubinstein goes for another very nice move, bishop d6. And again, it's a prophylactic move because it again deals with the threat of f4. The point this time is that in case of f4, the bishop is no longer stuck on h2, but it's actually active on um, d6, and white can continue with knight c5, attacking that knight on d7, yeah? and after knight takes c5, dc5, and now the bishop is attacked. Yeah? Now, well, black has a choice, but not a very happy one. For example, taking on a5, bishop a5, b takes a5, makes the pawn on b7 eternally weak. So white will simply just double on the b-file and, uh, well, black will have awfully passive pieces defending that pawn. Uh, another move is bishop d8, but now e4 is very nice. You see how badly black's pieces are and pretty passive as they are. Um, and white uh, uses this to open the center with e4. Both his rooks can operate on the open files. Bishop c7 is an attempt to uh, exchange the active bishop on d6, but after bishop takes c7, 
uh, rook knight c7, rook c2 again, we have this uh, idea of rook c2, doubling on the file and gaining access and control over the file. So f takes c3, rook takes c3, rook takes c3, rook takes c3, knight a6, let's say a3, and again, very dominating position for, for white, obviously, with exchanges. And now uh, the uh, passivity of that rook on a7 is even more visible, and practically white is playing a position and exchange up because that rook will never see the light of day unless b7 is sacrificed, but giving that up that pawn would just bring a losing position for black. So, to go back, after bishop d6, two moves in a row, the, uh, the threat of f4 has been prevented, so black abandons the idea and goes for knight d8. Yeah. Knight c5, white continues with the, uh, with the plan, Knight takes c5, bishop takes c5, yeah, bishop takes c5, bc5. And again, Rubinstein did not mind the exchanges because he uh, improved the pawn structure, opened the b-file, and now that pawn is really, really weak on the uh, b-file. Yeah, and the rook is still stuck on a7. However, as chess strategy teaches us, uh, one weakness usually is not enough to win a game because uh, one weakness normally can be defended uh, by the weaker side. So, for example, if black only had b7 uh, as a weakness, he could just defend it three times, maybe even bring the king to c8 and defend it with all his pieces. And then if white did not have uh, any other way to break through or create a weakness somewhere else, the game would be drawn because that weakness will be defended and no breakthrough. However, we, this, uh, we know again from strategy, and this uh, logically leads us to the principle of two weaknesses, which is um, actually a way to win games like this one, when there is one weakness fixed on b7, but white needs another one, normally on the other wing, to mm, uh, break through and um, spread out the defenses, that uh, uh, black's defenses, and then um, combining display on, on both sides of the board, at some point black will not be able to cover everything. So this is the general scenario that um, you know, that it follows yeah, in, uh, in similar situations. So black goes king e7, rushing with the king to c8 to cover the weak pawn on d7, on, um, uh, on b7, rook b2, Improving the position of the rook, king d7, rook e b1, king c8. So now first we have this first phase when um, white is piling up against the one weakness, the existing weakness, tying down black's forces to its defense, and only then shifts uh, his attention to the other side of the board. So king e2, rook e7, so you see all black's pieces are defending the weak pawn. Yeah. So white cannot win it, but that's why white actually opens the second flank on the king side. So he goes king f3, and the idea is to go g4 and open some files on the king side. So rook e4, g4, and g6. Yeah, trying to maintain these pawns, but this won't happen for long. So rook g1, the threat is now to take on f5, take on g5, yeah, knight f7, defending the pawn on g5, and now h4. So white is uh, going to open files on the king side, and he will use these files to penetrate black's position. So g takes h4, g takes f5, g takes f5, and rook g7. So this was white's idea. He activated his rook via the king side. And of course, this extra pawn doesn't really mean much for black, because both h4 and f5 are weak, and they will likely both fall. So, uh, knight d8 and rook g8. Pinning the knight and limiting it, the mobility of both knight and king. Uh, so up to here we, we have seen this very nice demonstration that started with this uh, very nice and deep prophylaxis, which I hope you appreciate it. Uh, and then we continue with this, let's say, classical way of conversion of an advantage. 
like I said, it follows the principle of two weaknesses. First, it was spinning down, black down uh, uh, to the defense of the B7 pawn, then opening a second front on the other side of the board and going after the weaknesses that were created there. So black plays f4, trying to um, exchange uh, one weak pawn, the pawn on f5, uh, and try to, to avoid uh, ending up uh, pawn down when losing both these pawns. So rook h8. This is systematic play by Rubinstein, and it's uh, interesting that uh, here and, and on the next move, uh, Rubinstein actually decided not to improve and relocate his knight. Maybe he just thought that the knight is still okay on a5 um, by uh, attacking that pawn on b7, but in fact after f4, the rook, the rook is no longer defended by the f-pawn, and white could have played knight c4, because dc4 loses the rook to king e4, and the knight is relocated to either d6 or e5, again with very strong effect. Yeah? But Rubich then was just systematic, he just left the knight there for the time being, went rook h8, threatening to wing the, the h4-pawn, f takes e3, f takes e3, and king d7. Yeah? Black is tied down. And this is normally uh, uh, a characteristic of, of players with good technique because their technique feels like, uh, in a way, strangulation. You know, it just, you know, it just is, is it's, it's like um, uh, limiting movements more and more, like Python, you know, uh, just squeezing, squeezing, squeezing until the opponent cannot really move. And you will see Rubinstein will continue with this Python strategy until the end, just limiting the, the mobility of his opponent's pieces to the maximum. Here again, he had a chance to go knight c4, yeah, like mentioned, again, but he chooses, like I said, systematic, switching the flank of the attack using the other rook, rook g2, intending to activate it to g7 or g8. And notice how black is actually losing this game because of that unfortunate rook on a7. So rook e8, abandoning the pawn on h4, but the, that pawn couldn't really be saved because white was threatening with rook g7, rook g8 to um, win material. So rook h4, rook e7. So black is trying to defend along the seventh rank. And white doesn't really mind that because he will be using the eighth rank instead. So king c7, rook g g8, attacking that knight on d8, and rook d7. Now look how passive this is. But you could say, okay, but he just stays put, okay? And uh, what can happen? Yeah, b7 is defended. Well, everything is compact. How can you lose this? Yeah, but uh, you know there is this uh, the straw that breaks the camel's neck, and this time uh, it's the last piece that needs relocation. Remember the rooks were on the b file, attacking b7. Now they are on the eighth rank, and the only piece that has not been relocated is still this knight. And now Rubinstein sees, okay, now it's time to relocate that knight. So where does the knight belong to? Well, c4 is no longer available, yeah, because dc4 would happen. But the knight can take a longer path and land on this beautiful central square e5. So knight b3. So knight is going to c1, d3, and e5. Once the knight gets to e5, black will no longer will have to move the rook, and that will mean that he needs to still defend that knight on d8. So a5, try to get some breathing space, knight c1, rook a8, at least the rook moved now, knight d3, and yeah, the knight is coming to e5, and now b5. Black is trying to get some, some breathing space, yeah, but unfortunately this won't save him. So c b6, king b6, and now knight c5, not on e5, but on c5, here it's closer. And again, the problem is the rook has to go to d6 to defend the, the knight twice, yeah, because it attacked twice, so both rooks need to stay there, yeah. And now a4, very nice, I would say, sadistic move uh, by white, just fixing everything, preventing the king's activation by b5. You could also call it a prophylactic move, preventing king b5, and more or less putting black in the tsukzwan. So you see, even though material is limited, how um, black loses because of uh, lack of mobility. 
Yeah, chess is a game of activity, chess is a game of mobility, and if you lack it, yeah, that means that your position is seriously compromised. Rook c8, uh, but then you can still ask yourself, okay, but he still stays there, rook c8, I just stay put, how do you win? Well, which, which piece remains? Yeah, These are all great. Yeah, They're all working to the maximum of their uh, potential. What remains is the king. And the king enters the game with the decisive effect. King g4. Rook a8. King f5. And now the end is knight. The only thing that white needs to be a little bit careful is that if king e5 does not run into knight f7 check, yeah? But that is easily solved. Um, if, for example, Blake remains uh, passive, rook c8, first rook f8, and when the rook moves, king e5. Yeah. And then winning material. <clears throat> the point is, of course, that knight f7 check is met by rook f7, and after this... White can again be sadistic and play a mate or win a rook. Well, rook or mate, it's your choice. Uh, in the game, actually, uh, this uh, finale happened faster. Black played uh, king c7, but after rook h7, he resigned because, again, going to b6 allows this rook d8, rook d8, and rook b7 mate. So, very nice. Positional masterpiece by Akiba Rubinstein, uh, starting with these very nice deep prophylactic moves, especially Rook C2. And then from that moment onwards, consistent and uh, merciless strangulation of the opponent. Well, I always wish I, I can play like this. Uh, sometimes, on rare occasions, it happened. Uh, but yeah, it's. I just find really uh, aesthetic pleasure and looking at and games like this and especially when understanding the ideas behind the moves and I would advise you to, to actually whenever you look at games of, of strong players to try to understand the ideas not just run over the, uh, the game just quickly but take some time and try to understand the ideas uh, of the moves and I, I can assure you that you will appreciate the games the moves and the players even more so, this concludes the analysis for today. Make sure you subscribe to my video YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, yeah, have a good day or evening and uh, I'll see you soon again.